Okay, so we'll call the order and for our first activity, we should approve the agenda. Is everyone okay with the agenda? We have a motion. Is the motion situation? Uh, just by consent. There's no right. hearing. No. Nothing hearing no. We're we'll we'll on to the comments. Deem it approved. Uh, so the only comments I have are to say that since we last met, there was a city council meeting <laughs> where we all had to uh, uh, go through an application process to have our terms uh, seats kind of kind of redone. Um, some of us are now on two year and some of us are on three year terms yes. at this point. I think everyone knows. See, I'm having Maybe trouble. one and two. What are, one, one and two. It was one and two. Okay, so um, if I recall, I think Leslie and I and someone else had a two. That um, I think John, did you have a two? Yeah, you weren't informed. <laughs> no, you were. No. Right. That's right. That's absolutely right. That's how it went. Yeah. Thanks, Stephanie. So, uh, so yeah, John, Ariana, you have um, one year terms actually. And then in next year you'll Aaron. go to a two year term. Mm -hmm. So it's just Another it's just staggering. Year. Everyone will always get a two year term, but we needed to stagger the first one. Right. Uh, but also in that process, Kim was very forward about having, um, you know, personal situation where he was going to miss a lot of meetings, and uh, Leslie had stated that she was happy to have everyone stay in exactly the same way, so she endorsed Kim to stay. But to, a little bit to our surprise, the city decided, city council decided to go ahead and um, you know, appoint Aaron. Here, Aaron Kosicki, our new member in Kim's seat, um, because Kim had other things going on. So, with that, I would say welcome Aaron to the Montpelier Planning Commission. Um, I know Aaron's an attorney in town, same as me and Leslie. Little known fact, we all were in the same exact law school class together. So, if we get one more person from that 2011 VLS class, we've officially taken over Montpelier so Planning. Next, next October, we're going to have like a I'm all in favor of I'm all in favor of more planners. Uh, I think yeah, we don't want too many redundant skill sets. Uh, but but he is replacing a, a lawyer, so the balance that's, that's stays. Um, <laughs> and so with that, Aaron, if there's anything you'd like to tell us about yourself. Uh, yeah, no, I'm just um, happy to be here. I, I think I'm going to be quiet for a while. And just yeah, and we've all been there with silly questions, and from it's Mike's perspective, <laughs> right? Especially with this, um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think our planners probably see a lot of the yeah non-planners having silly questions, and just depending on what your background is. Um, exactly, exactly. And so that's the only comments I have. Uh, and so Leslie uh, will be here at the next meeting, I expect. Um, so I'm filling in, obviously, as vice chair here. Uh, so moving on to general business, um, we have one person from the public in the audience. Ma'am, did you have anything to say to the planning commission? Okay, great. Okay, so with. Uh, oh, yeah. So I'm pregnant. We'll have to start making setting daycare. Right, yeah. right. <laughs> That's great. Congratulations. Congratulations. Yeah. I guess I feel like I was I was pregnant and she'll be she's to the end of March. Oh, what's that? Yeah. See, this is what happens when you appoint a young board. I didn't have this problem before when everybody was in their sixties. Planning commission babies. It was all grandkids. Aaron, you have a daughter? Yes, I have a daughter. Kids. So, yeah. We all have them. Okay. Well, with all of those wonderful announcements, um, 
can move on to the draft uh, landscaping and screening standards that Mike has. Yes, and I apologize. I didn't get these out sooner. I was working on them right up to the last minute today. Um, so if we want, we can put these off till um, next month if you guys want an opportunity to review them and bring back comments. Otherwise, I can... I was going to print out a strikeout copy, except it was all red. So it's all pretty much new. Um, so for Aaron's benefit and for anyone in the public, um, the landscaping and screening was the biggest set of issues that we have with the zoning that was adopted in January. And um, just some of the basics um, were just the, the standards were very objective and strict and there weren't very many ways to work around it and so what ends up happening is we would have requirements where somebody would need eight trees and 40 shrubs and the property currently has 10 trees and 30 shrubs so do they have to cut down two trees to plant more shrubs you know and these are the questions it said you had to have this and this and so um, we were you know we, we just wanted to build more flexibility into the rules give the applicants more um, direction into what they should be actually doing and give the DRB some flexibility to make some more, I guess, rational, reasonable standards. The other issue was just the standards were so, um, they, they were pretty, pretty high. So they were more set up for a suburban setting rather than an urban setting. So when you try to go and require so many trees and shrubs per square foot of linear foot of your building, uh, which is what the old requirements were, were pretty densely packed in. And so you end up trying to fit 10 trees onto a quarter acre lot. You're just like, with the building, I just can't fit 10 big trees um, with a parking lot and a driveway and all the other limitations. And then there were no ra waiver requirements. There really weren't very many non-conforming requirements. Um, how do we handle grandfathered uses? So we pretty much said... Um, as staff, we will go back and try to rewrite these. Most of what you have through here go through all the changes that we've found since we started using this in January. So once we started using the actual new regulations in January, we started finding some little things, some big things. Um, and what we've been going through as a planning commission are just checking our way through what we agreed to make changes on here and there. Um, Landscape was big and slopes were big, um, but we're not going to address slopes tonight um, at the request of Leslie and Barb, um, which we've actually made decisions on, but Barb wants to revisit them. So we'll take that up in uh, next month. But uh, So if you want, I can go through some of what I started to do with landscaping and screening, um, some of the thoughts I put into it, and then... I could leave, either we can review it right now or we can leave it for next month if you want to take some time to read through the details. I'm, I'm fine with working on it now, okay. um, but I don't I don't think it was like yeah, controversial in any way when we discussed it previously. So I think mm -hmm. it's not like we need to wait for Barb and Leslie on this one. Yeah. Um, so so okay. the yeah the purpose is the purpose point A. These are the same as were in the current draft that we have. And we kind of reviewed these really quick at the last meeting because I tried to use this as the basis of coming up with a new set of rules. Um, so the goal of landscaping and screening, this landscaping and screening is a requirement that's in site plan. So site plan, um, single and two family do not have to go through site plan. Everything else has to go and get a site plan approved when they come in for a zoning permit. Uh, landscaping and screening is just one of those requirements that goes in with site plan. <laughs> yes. It's all right. We haven't gotten there yet. Uh, John Snell is uh, from the tree board. Uh, so... The purposes of the landscaping and screening, they're intended to protect the quality of life and community character by enhancing the appearance of the built environment as viewed from the public vantage points. To create 
shade along sidewalks and walkways and within parking lots. Three, provide a landscape buffer between residential and non-residential uses. And four, screen land uses and development that create visual clutter and distraction. So these I will bring back up as we go through. So the applicability, this is um, a kind of a, a legally term for what needs to meet the landscaping requirement. And in this case, all development requires site plan approval all development requiring site plan approval shall meet the provisions of this section except changes of use where the sites have previously been developed in accordance with an approved site plan and where the proposed development will not change or be required to change any landscaping or screening. The reason for this being added in is we had questions that came up because we would get a project where you know let's say the building across the street there somebody was going to change from an office to a barbershop. Everything's going to be internal. We're not changing any parking. We're not changing any buildings. But legally, they have to go through and meet these landscaping requirements, even though they're not changing anything on the outside of the building, unless we provide an out for them, which is really what this is doing. This is saying if, if you already have a developed lot and you're doing a change of use, the change of use should require you to go through and do a landscaping plan. But in this case, you're not. As long as everything is inside the building, we're not going to make you go through and add trees to an ex if you have an approved site plan. So if you've previously gone through site plan approval, got a previously approved site plan, we're not going to make you go back through um, these requirements. Are there other exceptions we should include there where, where it's the same thing where someone's making a change that requires a review process, but they're not actually changing anything outside? We went through, um, the Meredith, who's the zoning administrator, and I went through a number of those, and we, we had some in here that we took out. And in some cases, what we have are four standards below this. So we're going to talk about um, just so I get them all in the right order. Um, street trees, parking lots, general screening, and then total site landscaping. So within each one of those subgroups, there's some exceptions. So in some cases, you can, you know, you might have to meet landscaping and screening, but you might not have to meet street trees because there'll be an applicability statement specifically for street trees and specifically for parking lots. For example, parking lots, you only have to add trees to a parking lot if the parking lot has more than 10 parking spaces. So there's an exception in there um, for that specific piece. And hopefully it'll make a little bit more sense because we talked a little bit about did we want to have more exceptions up top or do we want to have more waivers down below or non-conforming? Because that's a lot of our issues is we're not dealing with people building something new in a green field. We're talking about mostly people redeveloping existing sites or adding something to an existing site. So then, will be required to change language in there, mm -hmm. specifically referencing other exemptions from the other reasons why you might not have to do something? Uh, you may end up having to have as a requirement, you may be a, have a conditional use, and as a part of the conditional use, they require screening which may send you into this section through the conditional use section. So um, the proposed development will not change or be required to change. The required to change is going to be probably through somewhere, a different mechanism that requires screening. Or it's requires. Some other yeah. yeah. Um, so some of the new things that we tried to do, um, Meredith and I went through and kind of started to talk about how we would better structure the sections because we write a lot of reports and we write a lot of decisions and what we wanted to be able to do is to start to group some things into rules which are things that aren't really about requirements but um, application rules talk about uh, they shall include any part of a site um, shall be included as a part of any site plan and shall meet the following be on one or more sheets with the locations of all landscaping and screening elements with a key to identify species of plant materials. Uh, applications for major site plan shall include a landscaping and screening plan prepared by a licensed landscape architect. So that's actually in the current zoning that we have right now. 
is the requirement for major site plans to have a pro professionally prepared plan. Um, but those aren't really things for a decision that we have to go through and write into a decision or that's just, there's just more administrative uh, application rules. And then in the next section is administrative rules where we try to go through and outline a few other pieces. Um, up, uh, the following rules apply um, when applying landscaping and screening. I just got that double word. I'll take a look at that. Um, planting shall be defined by their mature or maintained height as identified on figure 3-20. So previously, we would talk about large trees, but we never actually defined what a large tree is. So it existed in this table, but we never called it out. We've now officially called it out to go and say, a large tree is a tree that is going to grow to be more than 50 feet tall when mature. And that appears in figure 320. In making calculations regarding minimum plantings, one plant may be counted towards meeting two or more different requirements. Again, this really isn't, this is just an administrative rule um, because we had this come up as a question. You know, if somebody plants a tree that's next to the sidewalk and next to the parking lot, can I count that tree towards meeting both requirements? And this is just clearly saying you can. Uh, the planting specifications, many of these existed in different places. We kind of consolidated them all into one place. So planting specifications, again, is just something that later on we can reference to go and say, if you're going to plant a tree, you've got to meet the planting specifications. Um, plant materials shall meet the minimum caliper as shown on 320. So on that figure. I just have a quick question about 320. Mm -hmm. um, so it's just going to be a DRB call as to whether a particular tree, for instance, would have a mature height of over 50 feet. These are all, uh, you, you can generally know that by, by looking at it. And if not, you can always ask the tree board. They will tell you whether a tree will be a, a large tree, a medium tree, or a small tree. For the most part, you can um, check the... So we're not concerned that there'll be debate over whether... I, I wouldn't be concerned about it from an administrative maple. standpoint. That's, that's, these are the things that we, we have to deal with. So really, in a certain sense, we can put it back on the property or on the applicant to go through and say, you know, I have no idea what, you know, how big this box elder is going to get. You know, can you get us some information on the mature height of this tree? And you can probably check a number of different sources to kind of get that information. But if it's 50 feet or more, it's a large tree. And if it's 30 to 50 feet, it's a medium tree. If it's less than 30 feet, it's a small tree. So, so there will be like some in your office decision making. Yeah, and a certain in, at a certain point, we we would have to go and determine whether something would be a large or a medium tree. If there's a call to be made, we would just have to make it. You know, if the if the tree guide says it'll grow between 45 and 55 feet we would have to make a call as to whether or not that's going to be considered a smaller or a medium or a large tree. Um, in the tree board standards and policies, the A300, what's the, what is like the nature of those? Uh, I, it's, it's actually a national standard. I Googled it to just to look up ANSI A300 standards and it's, John, could speak that just a, so we, we kind of like building code for trees. Right. We have our own that is essentially the 300, maybe with a few modifications. Uh, no, that would that would relate. My understanding would be that would relate to planting the tree, the care of the tree. I'm just wondering. It just makes it sound like someone might be looking for the standards and policies. Yeah, I don't. I think the issue we had was there. It's not an adopted standard, and so the way this is worded, John, for your benefit, is planting should be in accordance with the standards and policies of the Montpelier Tree Board, which generally follows the ANSI three A three hundred standards. I can. So, so the question. But so the question is, if there's a controversy that comes up. Will you have any kind of formal policy to fall back on? Like, is 
is that what is that what you're getting at, John? Where like if you if, if you haven't formally adopted this or anything, like we're just wondering how yeah, yeah I just don't know solid what it's going to be. So I'm reading this. I know I have to follow this. What does that mean? Where do I go? We're imagining if someone if someone follows this, but it's not quite what the tree board has in mind. How would that be resolved? Yeah. That, that would be, in fact, you would all be trying to follow. Yeah. So we say just generally follow this. Yeah, I can strike the word generally if you want. Or uh, then do we need, if it's the, the policy of the tree board to follow the A300 standard, should we just say that planning should generally <coughs> follow the You okay with just specifically referencing the standard itself rather than okay. Uh, I mean, yeah, there's it's, yeah, it's just there are a lot of ones that a lot of places that that have it. It is a single standard. So you have to pay to read the standard. It's actually the same. It's true for the building code too. We 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 have adopted building codes, but you know, I don't have a copy downstairs. If we adopt this, I have a general rule of trying to keep copies. You know, so. You can come view the copy. Okay, available in the planning office. So you'd have to come and look at it. Yeah. I don't know. I'm not a fan of like requiring people to follow something that we can't give them. Can I just come to it? Yeah, sure. I'm John Snell, by the way. You're not a fan of. Oh, just having a requirement that we can't give to anybody. We have to tell someone then to go buy something to understand what we're requiring of them. Um, so I don't know if there's like an alternative way of getting that. If it's intended to accomplish. Okay. Well, can I just back up? Yeah. Um, so we So if the, if the tree board Policies and standards have not adopted. First off, what's preventing you from adopting it? Would it be if it were to be adopted, is there a significant you know, if this is generally consistent with OT A three hundred? Would the standards be would there be enough difference between OT A three hundred and the tree board standards where that could be standalone document? It seems like there's two possibilities. One is your office has a copy of A300 and makes it available. Uh, the other would be we would adopt a document that mirrored that, uh, in which case we'd have to buy it anyway to, to, to see it, to have access to it. Uh, the beauty of having a standard is that when it's updated, you're notified. I mean, we certainly could go and change the wording to be more direct and say planting shall follow ANSI A300 standards, and then, then it's a requirement, and we just keep it in there. Um, I was just being a little bit cautious in the fact that it hadn't been adopted as, as an official standard. Now, we could basically adopt it on their behalf by just putting it in here as a shall, then anyone who's um, getting a, a zoning permit would have to do their tree plantings in accordance with that standard. So John's concern, though, was that people will have to pay something to have their own copy I, of I this. don't like to do it either, but at the same time, um, we already do that with a number of our requirements. Comes to as how, I said, building code. Everything that how, everything that Chris Lumber mm -hmm. does is all 
how burdensome would it be for Montpelier to have its own adopted standards, which basically copy the A300? It's a question for John as much as it is for Mike. How much of a, how, how difficult would that be to, to do a reference to Montpelier's own standards and then just, and then you would, and then that would be something that the tree board can adopt and then you could, we could hand out copies of our own standards, obviously. My guess is what we need to do is to get a copy of 300, uh, you know, mirror it, and then have it that approved by the city council. Is it worthwhile? Like, is it worth it? Like, is it likely to be? I, I, I would probably be okay adopting the standard and just having a copy downstairs. I don't think, um, because usually what we're going to end up doing in, in the same way that people who have questions about building codes, you, you don't ever actually look up your building codes. You actually just <laughs> ask the building inspector, how high is my railing going to be? And not try to figure out the 17 pages talking about railing heights and how far the drops are and whether it's a historic building or not a historic building. You just go and ask the building inspector and he'll tell you, I want to see this height. And you say, okay. Yeah, um, in this case, they would call John. <laughs> they would go and say, I'm looking to plant a tree. Um, and I got to meet this ANSI A300 standard. What do you want me to do? And John will say, I want you to go and keep it wrapped in burlap or not wrapped in burlap or dig a hole this big or I want to see the this much material of this type put in the hole. I want to see it staked in this way. I want to see it wrapped on the bottom, not wrapped on the bottom. You know, whatever the expected standard is, John will let them know. And that's what we would be just looking for is that the tree board has taken a look at the plantings and has agreed that this is sufficient to meet the A300 standard. Is this, new this is this one is new um, for the A300. Some of the other pieces are not the invasives. Um, so the new pieces are two, three. And seven. The others are either identical or just tweaked. So, in the summary, you just proposed and If they have a requirement to plant a tree, then the tree will have to be planted in accordance with this. So, it could be. That tree could be coming as a result of um, needing to meet the street tree requirement or the parking lot tree requirement. They have to plant a tree. Um, we would just go and say, you've got to meet the planting specifications. And at that point, they would start to coordinate with the tree board. So we need help meeting the standard? Yes. Yep. Yeah, in the same way that we would reference the uh, public works on stormwater standard, we, we don't understand the stormwater stuff, but we would rely on, or erosion control, we would rely on public works to go and give us advice on whether or not a proposal um, is going to sufficiently meet the erosion control of the state standard. Is that the reasonable? I think so, yeah. I mean, our... our concern is that we continue to see trees poorly planted uh, and you know two years later they were gone and that's the end of it yeah i mean i guess one one example you were mentioning to me was just recently the, the co-op i guess has to go down and replant all their or a number of their trees because that's they weren't what, properly five years now they weren't properly planted at the start and now we've got to go back and fix them so we're just their concern from the tree board is that we, we have an opportunity to try to make sure if we're going to get if we're going to try to reforest and, and green up Montpelier that we're planting things correctly I want to step back real quick and just cover a technical thing if should we just make all of our changes or suggestions um, kind of as we go um, kind of informally, and then at the end of this vote, 
to oh, yeah. vote on the entire thing with changes. Does that sound good to everybody? So that we're not going to have to stop and vote on every little decision. Um, okay. Change to change it to the party should be in accordance with the American Indian standards. That's what I've heard. Add a caveat I would probably look to have it be more outside of the rules. I'm trying to think. Um, we had a little bit of this discussion when we were doing stuff with the Conservation Commission. How much is stuff that we can, in the office, go and tell people you should go and talk to the Conservation Commission, and how much of it is they have to go talk to the Conservation Commission. Um, if somebody comes in and has hired a, a landscape architect and a horticulturalist who's familiar with the A300 standards, do I have to make them go? If it's in the rules, I officially have to go and check with John to make sure that they've checked in with the tree board. I would, I would rather just go and leave it up to them, the applicant, to Determine compliance. That would be my thought. You can go either you were way. Saying you're just putting it there as like a, a courtesy report. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. You, Which you can consult with. It's like an optional thing. I could try, I could try to work up some language. I can I can chew on on a way of putting that as a as as an option about the Montpelier tree board. <laughs> All right, I can put I can put a sentence in on that. We're good with three. Good John. Do you, do you think that last bit covers your concern from before? Stephanie's reference to getting help from Mike's office and the tree board. Yeah, I'm just. It's a, it's a policy decision. There's no different ways of attacking issues, and that's we can adopt our own rules, which can be more flexible. We can adopt an industry standard that's generally helpful for people who are coming in from away. Somebody from Burlington can come in and know the NC standard and not have to worry about learning a new uh, learning a new standard. That that's the advantage of standards, but the disadvantage is you you give away your flexibility, you give away your well, that's that's if you were custom, custom. custom. Yeah, yeah. custom things that we can do that are yeah, I don't we imagine have tree standards. planting something that changes very often. <laughs> Seems like it stays oh beg to differ. <laughs> the quality of the planting varies widely. What I mean is, like, what best practices are probably don't change because trees and the ground don't change. That's all. Yeah. But whether somebody's following the practices. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, if the hospital just planted a bunch of trees, and I guarantee you that when the bid spec ran out, it said these will be planted in accordance with the A300. Mm -hmm. This protection of their interests, basically. Um, so backing up one just real quick because we were talking about what was new. I thought I would just touch on what's new about um, number two. Um, so that requirement just talks about plantings being in the center of um, centered in an area meeting the minimum planting area specified in 320. So again, what the table on 320, which existed before, we just added a little bit to it. Um, talked about in the second to the last column the minimum planting area so if you're going to plant a large tree you have to set aside 100 square feet for it uh, before we we had these minimum planting areas but they really never applied um, it was kind of weird the, the way the rules were set up you'd have in this table a requirement for minimum planting area but no requirement in the rules that said you actually had to meet it so 
this starts to go through and say, if you're going to plant a large tree, you have to set aside 100 square feet. A medium tree is 49 square feet. Um, and I, I took a look at these minimum planting areas. They're actually quite low compared to some other communities. <coughs> but they're, they're higher than what we had before. So um, the disadvantage is the more area you add, the harder it is to actually fit in large trees because if you start requiring 220 square feet per large tree, that's great, probably better for the tree. But if you don't have 220 square feet, then I can't require you to plant a tree. And so um, it actually ends up becoming a barrier to adding more trees. Um, but John and I reviewed the, the, the numbers there and, and he's comfortable with them and I'm, I'm comfortable with them. I did see numbers in, in those ranges but I've also seen numbers, you know, Seattle, Oregon, um, other places where they had stingers in the 200s for, for, for a large tree. Um, so we just required in there, we just specified again, these are just planting specifications that we, we, we don't care about the shape. If you want to make on your plan a square, you want to make them a circle, whatever, we, we don't care as long as it's roughly centered in the middle. Uh, but it can't be narrower than the minimum planting area. So you couldn't have 100 square feet and decide to plant a large tree in a 2 foot by 50 foot planting area. And no, you, you actually have to meet the planting area can't be narrower than 5 feet. So it can be 5 by 20. That's fine. Um, and planting areas shall be suitable for rooting of trees and shrubs as applicable and maintained in impervious conditions. So that requirement really just gets back to the fact that we don't want people to, after they plant the tree, then go through and build the sidewalk over it. You know, you have to keep it in a pervious condition going forward. Um, so three we talked about, four, five, six didn't change. Five and six are just encouraged. Um, and then seven we added, which was retention of existing plants on sites to meet landscaping and screening equipment. Actually, that one was moved. So that one existed, but only for total landscaping. So um, it didn't count for some of the other tree requirements. So we just moved it up so it was all the planting specs were in one place. It's, I'm just throwing this out there for John to see if he's thinks it's worthwhile to, to think about. Is it is it worth it to create some sort of bonus or incentive for native plants? For what? For, for native for plants? No. No. Like something where if they're native, then... No. no. Why is that? Oftentimes in, in a developed situation, native plants won't do well at all. So I think... So know, healthy trees are better than, than unhealthy native trees? There are certain trees that I think are made the no go list, right? They have that. Yeah. You know, ash and Norway maple. Uh, um, no, I'm, I wouldn't be concerned about native versus not. Okay. Having a diversity is better than also. Yeah. It's so if we move on to F, so what we've done as we've organ reorganized these things is we've had a number of these rules and just specifications and things up top. Starting in F, we start talking about the actual standards. So as our zoning administrator starts reviewing applications and writing recommendations, writing decisions, we her job is going to start at point F where we talk about all landscaping and screening shall meet the following general standards, which are here in point F as well as specific standards for street trees, parking lot landscaping, screening, and total site landscaping as applicable. So the general standards just go through and reference back up. All plantings shall meet the planting specifications above in E. Development shall not reduce the planting area or minimum planting area, uh, planting area dimensions of any existing plantings. So as we're reviewing this, we're now gonna go and, okay, you wanna build a sidewalk before, all we would look at is the sidewalk. Now we're actually going to look at, is that sidewalk going to be going over any required planting areas? Uh, where existing plants are retained to meet landscaping and screening requirements, development shall protect the plants as well as planting areas during the construction process. And this was another, this was another request of John that um, gets missed a lot of times is 
in, in trying to protect the existing vegetation, they protect it before, they protect it after, they don't protect it during construction. So we really want to make sure that during construction, these trees have a plan to protect them. So then the next four sections look at each one individually. So again, so point G, we start looking at street trees. Um, and this is really the first sentence, really it's kind of an applicability. Applications requiring major site plan approval within any district except urban one and rural are required to meet the following. So um, for everyone trying to pick that apart, um, each word's important. This is only gonna be required for major site plan approval. Earlier we, we didn't talk about it, but in the start of site plan, we have a discussion of what's a major site plan, what's a minor site plan. Major site plans are construction of um, primary structures. So that would be development on an undeveloped lot, development of accessory structures that are bigger than 2,000 square feet, building a parking lot of more than 10 parking spaces. Um, so you're talking about major you know, big landscape changes. We're not talking about um, adding a porch to an existing or adding a deck to buddies. You know, those are not major site plans. Those are minor site plans. Um, going through and, and making some changes probably going to be minor. So only major site plans are going to be required to meet the street tree requirements and not urban center one because it has a zero setback and there's no place to put a tree. Those street trees are literally street trees, which John is responsible for not zoning. I can't make somebody build and put a tree onto city property because that's our property. That's not their property. And then rural is, um, was exempt before, so we just maintain that exemption. Um, so the administrative rules for street trees... Um, we define street trees. This was, we did not have this definition before, so we didn't know what counted as a street tree. So now a street tree is um, trees located within the road right away. So if you do have a street tree, that is a John street tree, um, you can count that towards your requirement. Um, as well as all trees where the center of the tree is located within 10 feet of the frontage line. So now we've measured to the center of the tree, um, and if it's within 10 feet, it can count towards the street tree requirement. These provisions shall not be used to require applicants to plant street trees in the street right away where an application, where an applicant chooses to plant one or more street trees in the street right, right away, they must receive approval of the planting through the Montpelier Tree Board prior to applying for site plan approval. That's just uh, an option. We talk really quickly about utility standards. These are the same as are in the current zoning, except I reversed them, um, just how they're worded. I reworded them. Um, minimum plantings, street trees shall be planted to meet the following. Large trees shall be planted at a minimum ratio of one for every 50 feet of frontage, or medium or small trees shall be planted at a minimum ratio of one for every 30 feet of frontage. Street trees should be evenly spaced, but may be shifted to accommodate site features or to maintain site distance. Uh, preservation of existing trees to meet this requirement is strongly encouraged. So those are the minimum planting requirements. I have um, just a pause something about the, the administration of this. Um, my own maybe dumb question, but uh, people who do plantings with outside the major site plan I know this doesn't apply, but are mm -hmm. they policed in any way? Like I'm seeing how we don't want people planting under utility lines, but is there any way that we check on that outside of major site plan review? Um, so they're not required. I would probably say if somebody were planting and it was a minor site plan, the way this is worded, they would not, they could plant a large tree under a utility line because they are exempt from these rules. I could try to work on an applicability statement that could capture that. You know, another one like we had previously, which kind of would kind of talk about nobody's required to plant street trees, but if you do plant a street tree, 
we do have to meet these requirements. So we could make it not a requirement, except. Uh, I mean, I don't, that, I, don't, I don't have strong feelings about trying to police those things. I was just wondering how things applied. Yeah, I mean, in this case, what's required, um, so we work, the, the analogy I've used with all the zoning administrators I've trained, um, it's, it, everything's kind of like a bucket. So everything falls into one bucket, and if it falls into that bucket, it can fall into the next bucket and the next bucket, and so you kind of get these, you know. So in order to hit that requirement, you'd have to get through that initial applicability statement. If you can't get here by definition development, site plan, major site plan, all the way down through, you wouldn't have to meet that requirement, but we could change the rules to make it apply. That's just um, that's just a matter of policy. I'm not proposing that. If it's something that anyone feels like we need. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. Um, although they may, the, the utility standards, I could potentially move the utility standards up to planting standards because that tree may not be required to meet a street tree requirement, but it could, it would probably need to have some landscaping, the general landscaping requirement, in which case if it was under plantings, I might, it's a general planting. So when I get to the total landscaping requirement, and I look at all the landscaping that's being proposed on the site, I could consider moving that one up. I think that makes some sense and to not allow it may not catch not every, allow, all trees not allow that people get to do something that we're all going to regret later basically. Yeah. Yeah. I mean certainly uh, for example a single or a two family. You have a single family house, you're exempt from site plan at the top. So no matter what we change, you could go and plant all the trees you want under those power line right of ways. It's still a bad idea. I just can't tell you you can't do it. Um but if I move it up, it's more likely for us to catch maybe some of those other ones um, if somebody were trying to go through and plant um, to meet a total plant, total landscaping requirement. Um, and you'll get, when we get to that, it might, it'll make a little bit more sense. Um, move up to plantings. Um, so the, the minimum plantings are still there. So um, non-conformities and waivers, we did, I believe, had these before. So non-conformities. Non-conformities are grandfathered things. These are things that don't meet the zoning today, but were built before zoning, or at least before these zoning rules came into effect. So you, you have a house, you don't, you're non-conforming, you're going to do a major site plan. Um, you're expected to bring nonconformities up to compliance. Where a previous site, in this case, we, we have special provisions for a nonconformity. Where a previously, previously developed site is nonconforming with respect to street trees, the site shall be brought into compliance with the street tree requirements unless the applicant can demonstrate that the site lacks suitable area to meet the planting specifications. <coughs> Got some wording issues in there for additional street trees. So you can't. If you can't meet the planting specifications because you're non-conforming for a number of reasons, maybe the maybe the building is non-conforming and is right up at the sidewalk and therefore you have no place to plant it. Maybe it's only back a few feet and there's just not enough planting area that's left to to get a tree. So the DRB where the DRB finds that the public vantage points on a non-conforming site are negatively impacted by the built environment and that an applicant could create suitable planting area through the removal of impervious cover, the DRB may require the applicant to remove impervious cover and add additional street trees up to the amount that would make the property conform. So that's a reworking of the some of the written rules in there. And it's just really to give some flexibility to the DRB that goes and says, you know, you can't plant a street tree because you only have 85 square feet and you need 100 square feet to put that street tree in. But you've got impervious cover over here that you could easily remove to get your 100 square feet. We think, as the DRB, we're going to require you to remove that to plant the tree. That is appropriate for this. Um, 
So that's just giving them an, a little bit of flexibility. It's not really meant to be a, a big club to get people tearing up um, large amounts, but it just gives a little bit of flexibility for the DRB to have some some amount of um, ability to, to get some non-conforming properties conforming. That or was already in there, and I'm still trying to figure. And and I hadn't quite. I saw the or as I was reading A through D, and kind of don't want to have an or sitting in the middle of a of four of them. Um, I haven't quite figured that out. So what happens if somebody has 80 feet, I think where Stephanie's going, somebody has 80 feet of frontage, does that mean you put one large tree in one medium, one medium or small tree? Or what if I put two small trees? That, or can you exchange like three, what, what equals one large tree? Three small trees equals one large tree? How do you, we talked yeah. about that at the last Yep, level. and I have that, that actually comes in for, for the other plantings, but doesn't come in for this one, which was really just looking at the amount of frontage. Um, you know, a large tree every 50 feet or a medium or small tree every 30 feet. And, of course, you're like, okay, well, what do we do with an 80-foot of frontage? Is that a large tree, I think a medium tree? With some careful <coughs> writing, uh, A and B could be combined together to make them interchangeable. And is that what that means? So then you I, I, take that I take that as I take that as I take that as the 80-foot would allow a large and a medium. And I think we can it rephrase required? it to make is it the, very is clear. The question. But I think it also says... And you could just do public medium trees. Yeah, I mean, it says a large tree for 50 or medium small trees every 30. Which means you don't have to necessarily do a large tree. Yeah, you yeah, you could do two small trees. Yep, two small trees could get would two be small 60 trees feet. Large trees. One large tree would be at 50 feet. Um, yeah, it's just different ways of looking at it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you're saying that if you have two small trees, I think the way that's worked out, that was probably how we would enforce it if we did it. Would, would be to go through and say you can use large trees, you can use smaller, and remember these are minimum, so if somebody wanted to put in two large trees they can, but at a minimum they could put in simply two small or medium trees. You know, it's I find this quite challenging. It makes planting the trees look easy by comparison. <laughs> Uh, you know, there's reality, so I, I don't know how to, I, I don't know how to deal with it at this level. I, I just don't know. I guess I was just curious if there, I don't know any of are large trees better, or is there, is it? In is general, it, if there's room, we are encouraging people to plant large trees because of the difference they make in the streetscape. Um, you know, but if, it, if you're jamming it in and it doesn't work, then it doesn't work. What's, what's, the, what's the trees needs really is what we come down to. And I know when we, I did some uh, Google driving and, you know, found that there, it, we we've surprisingly don't have as much, as many street trees as I would have thought. So you start driving around specifically looking for street trees. And so I think any amount of trees, whether they're, small apple trees, you know, medium-sized trees or, or large trees, I think just getting more trees, I think is whether, you know, and if it, if it means two small trees rather than one big tree, it's probably going to be in the eye of the beholder or what's the project that's there. I always just look at a space that can accommodate a, a large tree. If we don't plant one there, it's a waste of that space. In the same way. That's where I personally So, so you're thinking putting A and B together and go warm? Yeah, so it's all really nice to say, if you have the space for a large tree, plant the large tree and then put small trees, or just plant, oh, right now you can plant it. Yeah, I mean, we could certainly word it to go and have that you're required to plant a large tree, and where the site doesn't support a large tree, you may plant a medium or small tree at a ratio of one to every 30 feet. It's, it's so subjective, though. I, 
and and also like in, and then having something that's kind of ironclad seems like it also comes with like pitfalls where like if we require if you have 50 feet it must be one large tree then well in the situations in which it makes no sense then also we're requiring something that's not the best outcome maybe it, without having to like to police this too much just having the flexibility of either medium or large and then saying for every large that would accommodate 50 feet worth of frontage would it be possible to say large if, if the space can accommodate a large trees encourage I mean, we, we have preservation. We have the preservation of existing trees to meet this requirement. Strongly encouraged. I can I can always add a, a t you know, move that one down or add an E that just goes and says that. Where you have space for large yeah, trees. Where you have space for large trees, but large trees are encouraged. Are pre or large trees are preferred. Yeah. Yeah, I would add. Well, it, this is three. Three little add a little e under those to this when large trees are preferred. Is the term minimum ratio used anywhere else? I might have to get a little confused because it seems that the only reason I heard is because I know it's a interval as opposed to a ratio. It sounds like a minimum. minimum. Oh, that's Your true. Interval may be more precise because I'm thinking like a larger ratio. Like one to sixty would be a larger ratio, but we're trying to achieve the Yes. Yeah. You would be correct. No, I think that's this is actually the wording that was could in. Be, you could use it to argue. Well, that's why I was trying to wrap my head around it. I, okay. I wonder if we just strike ratio, a minimum of. Seems like a minimum interval or something like that. Even if it's just at a minimum, plant it at a minimum of one for every fifty feet of frontage. I mean, you don't even have to say ratio. So yeah. That's. Sure. Nope, nope. That's good catch. That's we try to get away with being as Keep brief as we can. Keep it simple. <laughs> yep. Yeah, we'll try to. I'll try to. If we can combine those two. So then the E would actually end up being a D, but that's okay. We'll, we will make the letters work. Um, so we went through the nonconformity. So nonconformities are those grandfather things. Waivers now are are not – anybody can apply for waiver. So these are um, – even if you're not nonconforming, the Development Review Board may waive the street tree standards where an applicant demonstrates the waiver created – waiver requested creates the minimum variance from the standard and either a compli compliance with the street tree requirement would diminish the appearance of the built environment from a public vantage point or b existing natural features such as streams ledges wetlands could make compliance with the standard undesirable or impossible so there are waivers gives give a little bit of room for flexibility in case there's an environmental reason somebody can't plant a street tree or for whatever reason, there's a significant historic building that we really, you know, we we want that to be seen. We don't want to go through and, and hide hide the building behind uh, some street trees. And if anyone else has other waiver standards they would like to have more flexibility and those were just the only two that we came up with there currently aren't any waiver standards so this was just our first kind of role and to try to come up with um, yeah we try to we try to look at what's come in for a couple of the applications um, so now the second so we just quickly went through street trees now we're back to parking lot standards so this is the second one Applications, again, requiring major site plan approval. So there's the bucket where there is existing or proposed parking of more than 10 parking spaces 
shall be landscaped with shade trees to meet the following. And we have a definition of shade trees. So the one exception is portions of sites used for vehicle sales are not considered parking lots. And that was in the existing zoning. It's just called out differently here, but that existed before. We don't have to keep it, but I kept it in here for, for discussion purposes. Um, so one thing that helps a lot as you're crafting rules is is if you can define a term, make up your own term of art. In this case, we're just going to define what a shade tree is and say that's a shade tree. Are medium and large trees that are located within six feet of the edge of pavement when measuring to the center of the tree trunk. So that's that's a, a shade tree. Is that would you requiring to be in the center of the planted area? I that in that so that's in the planting area. So when you're required to meet the planting requirements, then you have to meet the planting area, which is why we put it all in the planting. But then you're also required to plant it within six feet. If you want to count it as a shade tree. So it's the just taking one step back. The purpose of parking lot landscaping is to provide shade. shade is there an aesthetic side to it I'm looking I'm looking at the purpose of primarily it's for shade okay and I'm I'm thinking about whether or not we should include car dealerships and whether so maybe shade's not as important for car dealerships but aesthetic it would be the same as a parking lot that's yeah that's a policy decisions as to whether or not um, I'm sure your vehicle dealers would not be happy with the shade trees and leaves and everything else. <laughs> they wouldn't be required to put them in the front to like to obscure the view, would they? If they were, uh, there's well, I mean, they 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 actually aren't exempt from the street tree requirement. They are just exempt from the shade for the display area as it goes back so within 10 feet of the road you have to have the street trees this is looking at all the rest of the parking lot with a large tree being providing a certain amount of shade medium trees certain amount of shade and you have to shade 40 percent of your parking lot so you calculate which i think is what the picture is on 319 parking lot shading illustration which just shows 48,000 square foot parking lot and all the street tree all the shade trees that would be required okay. and those three trees that are up by the road probably could also count as a street tree the rest of I mean, I'm fine with leaving the exemption there but I thought I'd just bring it up in case anyone had feelings about it um so the minimum planting requirement, um, shade trees shall be provided to, um, the, shall be provided equivalent to shade 40% of the parking area, including aisles and driveways. Um, so we didn't have a definition before. It just said you had to shade the parking lot. Does that include driveways? Does that include the aisles? Is it just the parking spaces? So we've now um, defined what this it is to include aisles and driveways uh, in accordance with the following parking areas located to the rear of the principal building will be screened from view at the street by the principal building that will be screened from view by the principal building or other screening may reduce the percentage of landscaping under this section from 40 percent to 25 percent for this area that's in the existing rules right now so there is a certain aesthetic component that if you're putting your parking lot behind your building, you don't have to shade it as much. That's again, that's a policy that's already that's that's what's in there right now. Each large tree shall be considered to provide 1,200 square feet. Each medium tree, 600 square feet. So you pretty much can go through and just add up the parking spaces, add up the number of trees, multiply it out from an administrative standpoint. The trees may be all along the north side and not providing any shade at all, but we're just counting trees. We're not counting where the shade is actually being cast. 
Um, but we figure again, progress. Incorporating parking lot landscaping into the site's stormwater management system is strongly encouraged. Uh, Non-conformities where an existing parking area is non-conforming with respect to minimal plantings required but lacks sufficient planting area to plant additional trees. The development review board may waive some or all of the parking and landscape requirements provided. The applicant demonstrates the development meets other landscaping and screening requirements to minimize the visual impacts of the parking from the street or abutting property. So we have a non-conforming one. This one does not have a waiver. I didn't add in a waiver. So you pretty much always have to plant parking lot trees if you're going to be expanding. Again, that's a policy. We, we were just trying to fit things in, make it work, and then we can start talking about if people want to add waivers or remove waivers. Um, we just want to try to make sure we hit each one of these and at least have a conscious discussion about pre-existing things that don't meet the rules. What do we do with them? Do we make them come up to the code? Do we not make them come up to the code? Is there a certain situation? If you do this, we'll make you come up to the code. If you don't do this, we won't make you come up to the code. Um, and that's what the nonconformities are. The waivers are just, you're building something new. Is there any flexibility in the rules? This pretty much says no. Um, so the third section was screening. The following screening standards apply to non-residential applications where the project abuts residential properties. So again, if you go back to the purpose statement. The purpose said screening, one of the reasons for screening is for screening residential to non-residential. Um, another place for screening, screening is where parking areas, utility services, or building mounted equipment are proposed or modified, and where the development review board has required screening as a condition of approval for another provision. So there are three ways that this is applicable. And, you know, so as administrators, Somebody comes in with an application, we're just going to see if any of those boxes are checked. If one of those boxes are checked, then they have to go through it. Um, so it's not automatic. None of these are automatic. So as somebody comes in with an application, they may be doing a project. They may require landscaping because they because they're doing something, a major site plan. But then once they get into it, they may actually not trip any of the, the requirements, at least through screening. Um, so the, this one didn't really have any rules that went along with it. So the performance standard that kind of we jumped right into was screening shall be applied to minimize the visibility and impacts of incompatible, disruptive, or visually unappealing aspects of the proposed development on the surrounding neighborhood. This actually was the existing language. This is not to be interpreted to mean all the views or areas or element to be screened shall be fully blocked. Rather, screening should be used to soften and break up views and to create visual interest elsewhere on the site so that the area or elements to be screened no longer dominate the view. So it's a, it's a performance standard. It's not really objective. It's kind of there. And then we kind of got to use these guidelines to determine whether somebody meets that standard. Um, so that screening can be done through a couple of different ways, landscape buffers, fences, walls, berms. Those are the, yeah, those are the materials, the, the three materials. Um, I don't think so. I think we've got this covered so far. Thanks, Thanks for coming so in, Josh. And thank you for doing this work. <laughs> Thanks, so. Yep. so um the rest of these kind of come into the specific things parking lots shall be screened from view from the street and abutting properties utilities all utility boxes pump stations substations shall be screened um service areas off street loading refuse outdoor screening mechanical equipment similar utilitarian site features shall be screened so again, every time it says shall be screened, we're back to that performance standard of, we're not saying you can't see it, we're just saying it's gotta be softened. Um, building mounted equipment, same thing. And then we've got non-conformity. So again, we're only talking in this case, not about waivers. If you're putting in a new air conditioning unit on the outside of a building, you're going to have to screen it. There's no waiver for that. If there's an existing 
AC unit that isn't screened and you're doing a project um, where an existing site is non-conforming with screening, the applicant shall be required to come into compliance unless the cost of compliance will exceed 5% of the project cost. In that instance, the applicant shall not be required to add screening or shall only be required to add screening not to exceed 5% of the total project cost. So if you're non-conforming but you're doing a major project, we can you know, doing a hundred thousand dollar project, we can require up to five thousand dollars worth of screening um, for the non-conforming pieces. Um, so, if somebody's doing a major renovation, they may be. Um, we would be able to get some of that up. But what comes up with a lot of times for us downstairs is um, we get a lot of small projects: five thousand dollars, ten thousand dollars. I'm putting a deck on buddies. That's an example, actual one that we had. We're putting a deck on the buddies. You know, do we require them to screen the dumpster because they put a deck on? I mean, the screening might cost more than the deck. Um, you know, uh, so we end up with a number of these things that we have to start to decide whether we're requiring them to do all these things, in which case they might not put the deck on because it'll actually cost too much. Or so we 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 simply put a cap on this that said five percent of the cost. We don't think that will deter people. If you're non-conforming and you're doing a small project, we're going to make you make some small changes that help to make things better over time. Sound good? So I have one maybe question um, about the applicability for site plan review, which we have for everything that we're single and two family, and I'm wondering what other planning uh, commissioners think about increasing that to uh, three to four. Basically, our definition of multifamily is four units. I think that's what the fire safety is. Yeah, that crosses it to usually five and more is considered a commercial right. as opposed to a residential. So, so lining it up with that, uh, uh, raising the bar. Really super, super, super so right now, I'm sorry, what's defining a residential? Right now, basically anything that's not a single or two family or less. Single or two family. Right. Is considered non residential? Well, not non residential, but. The state law exempts single and two family from site plan review. So we couldn't, even if we wanted to, require site plan for a single family home or a duplex. But we could, we, we can be more generous than the state. So we could go through, as John suggest you know maybe our three and our four unit buildings also should be exempt from site plan now so, site plan is the is the umbrella so if you exempted them from site plan you would also be exempting them from bike and pedestrian access and circulation the landscaping and screening which we're talking about now outdoor lighting Uh, solar access and shading and design and compatibility which is the architectural standards unless they're in design review. unless they're in design review in which case they got to go through design review anyways right. yep. and then I was just looking at screening guys yes yep <laughs> You're talking about yeah sorry I should yeah. So what John's looking at is really going back to the back as we talked about those buckets you kind of get in. This is this is one of the upper buckets. We can certainly go through and say landscaping does not apply to three and four families, in which case they would still have to go through site plan and they would still have to meet bike and pedestrian and these other ones, but they would be exempt from just that section. Does that make sense? You can mm -hmm. you can plug that exemption in wherever you want to see it. Um, in order to support your community goals and objectives. Um, I'm just thinking of the number of three and four units. Places out there, like, does it make sense to have a review this type of review for each one circulation? If you're turning a two unit into a three unit, right. if you get through the entire site plan process, yeah. like, is that something that we want? For most of the existing ones, it probably won't have to go through them, but if somebody were to come in to put in a new one. Yeah, yeah. like going from two to three. Well, even going from two to three, you have to be talking about constructing 
more than 2,000 square feet, you'd have to be having an addition of more than 2,000 square feet. You probably would be renovating existing space or putting a small addition. Because um, then you're not tripping into major site plan. Well, the mi minor site plans you'd be going through. The minor site plans are administrative. That's the big thing for us is um, a minor site plan is just administratively issued, just the same as a permitted use. We're going to look at it, but you're not going to a DRB hearing. We're not notifying abutters. We're just, you know, we're usually printing out an aerial photo, putting it down in front of you, and you grab your Sharpies and you go at it to go through and say, these are the changes we're making. We're going to put a dumpster in over here with this amount of screening. John's going to help us plant a tree if, if, a, if a, such a tree is required. To be a major site plan, to go to a public hearing. Some of these, um, well, again, if, if, depending on what level we're talking about, if we're talking about exempting at the site plan level, we would be exempting requirements for bicycle racks and, sideway, and sidewalks and the landscaping and screening, which most of them would be exempt but not all. Outdoor lighting, outdoor seating display or storage, which probably wouldn't apply here because most outdoor seating storage is going to be for more commercial. That's so a, a three family and a four family is not going to be a, not going to be applicable for outdoor seating display or storage storage. That's looking at tractor supply. Can I put stuff outside or not? And then design and compatibility. But I can. I'm certainly willing to put that into three two zero one if that's. Sometimes it's a matter of value. Is there is there an example of a three or four unit residential building that was built from new recently? Um, Maple Lane over by down Berry Street. Ribellini built a new building in the old Creamery parking lot. I'm trying to think if that was four units or six units. I think it's six. 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 Yeah. I think it's six. It was six. Okay. I'm trying so to think about. They had to do site planning. Yep. Um, but they would anyways because it's multifamily. So I'm trying to think of three or a four that's new. Had a four go to a six. We had that six. We've had um, a lot of. One offs, you know, threes, twos to threes, ones to twos. But I can't think of starting from scratch. Most of them have been either multi family or single family. It's, it doesn't seem like it comes up that much. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I feel like that's like that, that three to four. We're applying these standards feel like they're designed for commercial development. For a four unit, you can get a, a six and a one unit. Um, so it's Well, we can certainly go through and see if we finish them up. We can certainly see about either exempting, you know, taking a look through the rules and seeing how a, how that would affect yeah, so all, all, like, all of it. Could you, yeah. Mike, could you, could you take a look at, like, a, a little bit more about the impact would be, and it could be maybe something we look at next time and vote on? Because it's it's bigger than what we're looking at doing right now anyway. Yeah, yeah, I think it's I think it's bigger than the landscaping standards that we're looking at. I mean I think what John's looking at is exempting the parent of this one, which would affect this one. And I think we can have that vote because if that vote happens, this can be moving on on its own. 
can we put that on the agenda next time and maybe you give us a summary? I'm not asking you to do any work or anything, just at the time, maybe when Barb and Leslie are back, give us a summary. Three to four units impact. regarding site plan. Exempting them from major site plan, but still making it so that minor site plan applies. So, yeah, I mean, you do that for. Keep saying minor site plan applies if you go from two to three anyway, even if you don't really change much. Well, if we had the exemption at, at three or four, though, then that would just mean if somebody decided to take a duplex and add in a third unit into a carriage house, we would simply say you don't have to go through site plan. You don't have to meet any of those requirements because it's not any applicability. So they just have to get a permit. They would just, yeah. They would still need the zoning permit. They would still need to meet the parking requirement. They would still need to meet, you know, all of the other pieces of, of erosion control and storm water and everything. If it if it is applicable, but it wouldn't have to meet any of the other site plan requirements. I don't think there are too many. Is it still conditional use in a bunch? I thought we cleaned up most of those, but still conditional. I think in the other residential six. It. Mm. Yeah, it's just, and they change so much. I can't off it the top of my head. It seems strange that, yeah, three and four units are conditionally used in a lot of places. I don't think they actually it that is. I've got it right here, so look it up. I, I think we, I, I think it actually made it all the way to city council, and I think Ashley actually made it in the person who pushed to make most of them. Three or four is permitted. You see one, two, three, riverfront. It's conditional in the eastern and western gateways. It's permitted back in mixed use, res 1.5, res 3, res 6. It's conditional in res 9, so res 9 and res 24 in rural, it's conditional for three and four units. So those would be residential 9 is... Yeah, that's a quarter acre. I'm just trying to think about an area in town. Um, town for, Hill? For, um, no, Town Hill's residential 24. But Berlin Street, farther out Berlin Street gets to Res 9. So if you're out, out near Stonewall Meadows, um, Terrace Street, if you're getting farther out Terrace Street, I believe, is gets out to Res 9. So usually what happens in a lot of those places is usually you don't end up doing the three and four units. They'll subdivide into smaller lots, but that's certainly one we could look at as well. If we want those as conditional. If we could take a quick look next time. Um, yeah. Yeah, I'll see. I'll see what the and give the other folks a heads up about be. it. Um, so the final piece of the landscaping was total total site landscaping used to be kind of in the middle we pulled it to the bottom and so we kind of changed the order of those four requirements and the reason why is because total site landscaping actually counts any trees you planted as street trees count towards your total site landscaping anything that was a parking lands parking lot counts towards total site anything towards screening counts as well but at the same time, each one of those has exceptions. So at the end, we can kind of go through and say, all right, you may have been exempt from all three of these, but you still have to have some site landscaping. And so this is going to start to come up with a factor. And this is where a lot of this kind of is new. Um, so Urban Center 1 does not have to meet a total site landscaping requirement. It's got 100% impervious cover. So um, we can't really require landscaping if we also have... 100% cover that we allow. Um, administrative rules, naturally forested areas may be counted towards landscaping requirements on a two to one basis. Retaining two square feet of natural forest cover will count towards one square foot of landscaped area. It's just, we had this question come up from time to time. So this is new. Huh? That's new um, because we had it come up from a, a specific question of, of, of a project. Um, some, some sites kind of cut up into a hill, and could they count some of that? Um, so minimum planting area, this 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 will take a little bit of time, but I'll try my best to explain it as simply as possible. We needed to come up with a, a way of calculating how much landscaping 
So it's not just how much is green and open, but how much landscaping would be required. And we thought of a number of different ways of doing it. And what we eventually came up with was a system where we could look at, really depends how much impervious cover you have in the district in which you're located. Um, and it's really kind of a factor of, if you have allowed to have 80% coverage and you build 80% coverage, that means you have 20% that's open space. How much of that 20% should be landscaped is really the ultimate question. You know, and same with a 70-30 or a 60-40. You know, you always have this percentage that's left over. How much of that leftover needs to be landscaped? And so we kind of went through and said, well, if you did half, you'd have to do half. And we came up with some factors. And what's down here is actually spending too much time working with math. Um, these things actually cancel each other out, so the parcel size doesn't actually matter in the end. All that really matters is the amount of impervious cover. So you give me the amount of impervious cover, you multiply it times this number, and it'll tell you how much landscaping you need to have. It doesn't even matter how big the parcel is. So if you've got if you're going to have, um, if you're in Riverfront District and you're going to build 3,000, well, let me use one of the easy ones. If you're in a district which has 60% requirement for coverage and you're going to build 3,000 square feet of impervious cover, you'd have to have 300 square feet of landscaping because it's 0.1 is the factor. You just multiply one times the other, gives you 300. Now, we have our table, which has those things. You could plant three large trees. Three large trees. Each tree is worth 100 square feet. 300 square feet, three trees. Four medium trees, or you know, six medium trees. Whatever it is, just start adding it up using those formulas and give us the final numbers. This isn't all that different. What we replaced, what we threw out, was that other one which said building perimeter. For every one foot of building perimeter, you have to plant one tree and three shrubs or whatever it was that's under the old rules so it didn't really matter how big your parcel was it didn't matter all of your other things um you just end up it, with this weird thing depending on how big your building is depended on you know a small building with a big parking lot would have less landscaping so we just tried to come up with some rules that we thought would work and this is kind of what we came up with it looks funny and the idea is we could eventually, if this gets adopted, move this into those tables up front in, part, in Chapter 2. So Chapter 2 goes and says, for this zoning district, these are the requirements you have to meet. Well, you would just have a line in here that would go through and say, coverage, landscaping, and landscaping would have a factor in it that you would add in. That would just go through and say, that's how many square feet. Um, it's like yeah. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. It was my understanding Why? there would be no math. There, yeah, where, no, where's the math? There would be. Um, so uh, it's very hard to visualize. Um, but I mean, these these are the the you know ridiculous things that I've had to be going through to just go through and visualize it and to make things work. And the issue that comes up. You also notice with the minimum parking, uh, minimum plantings, is it's two sections. And what we did when we started to go through an actual showing how much landscaping, because even with a regular meeting your setbacks, um, riverfront, 80% coverage, if you had the minimum lot size of 3,000 and just met the setbacks, you're already 40% um, open space. Just meet the setbacks. You have no non-conforming, you're 40% open. How much of that has to be landscaped with trees and shrubs and flowers? You know, how much of that 40%? You know, well, in this case, it would be 120. So you could plant one tree and you'd be done. So we kind of ran through a bunch of these things to see which ones work. What ended up being an issue was these numbers work great at small. What was wrong with the version we had before was it only worked for big, you know, you want to build Shaw's, those rules work great, but they don't work great when we were working in an urban downtown. Um, so these new rules work great when it's small, and at a certain point, 
they just get to be too big. Um, you know, the amount of landscaping that timber homes would have to build with 200 trees they'd have to plant. And we're just like, oh, that's just ridiculous. We're going to be planting 200 trees. So we put a second factor in that said, once you reach over an acre of land, it's capped. That's it stops. So you get you, you have a requirement that goes up and up and up and up and up. Once your parcel hits one acre, it stops. Where's that? In That's here? the second. So so you've got a t number two, which says minimum planting area for parcels up to and including oh. one acre in size. And then if you get a three, there's minimum planting area for parcels greater than one acre in size. And those are fixed numbers because once you've hit that number it doesn't increase. So if you have a 10 acre site, your minimum landscaping is 4,300. You've got a two acre site is 4,356. Depending in the district you're in. I mean, I was just using that rural as an example there because rurals, those ones. Um, and again, so 4,356 square feet in a rural district would mean you'd have to plant 43 trees if, if that's where it was at. And if you have some forest already there, then it counts two to one. If you already have some forest, one. it would count two to one, and you can factor it down. You know, in some cases... So as long as you have, like, 8,600 square feet of forest, you're good. Mm -hmm. Which isn't that much. And we can always change those factors. We were just trying to come up with something that actually worked because the issue that we have today is that the landscaping rules as they exist don't work. Um, can you see some more examples of this? It's, it's some really good yep. I yeah. Like yeah, it's, it's hard. The, the philosophy of it, though, is really starting to look at this comparison of how much impervious cover, you know, if if you have to put a certain amount in that's impervious, then how much of the open space has to be landscaped? And that was really kind of what we were looking at. Um, but yes, I will try to come up with some ways because it's going to be hard to explain this, but I'm always open to anyone who comes up with other ways of coming up with a requirement. We could just not have it. The issue with it not being objective in some way is we want to have these also apply in minor site plans, which means our zoning administrator has to enforce it, which means they have to have a certain amount of objective rules. They can't just go and say character of the area. That's not their job. Their job is to go and say, I need a street tree every 50 feet. I can do that. I can enforce that. You know, having a requirement that says you shall landscape such that it has doesn't affect the visual impact on abutting neighbors that's not something a zoning administrator can enforce that's why we have a drb drb is your board of reasonable persons their job is to look at subjective standards and make a determination um, but we want to have as many as we can be administrative site plans first of all not to overburden our drb but secondly, also just to be able to um, have um, reasonable projects be able to go through without having a big deal. As we said, just simple things, a deck on Buddy's Burgers. Um, you know, that shouldn't need to go through a big hearing just to put a deck on. Um, but if we have standards, we can certainly go through and make sure that they meet certain performance standards that we can look at as a zoning administrator and say, yep, you meet these, you're good to go. Um, so really quickly, what, what is in there in the rest of that is talks about placement. Again, we're back to nonconformities and we're talking about waivers. So you can have nonconformities. Again, we're back to the 5% requirement if you're nonconforming. Um, and we've had a lot of these issues come up. People who have projects that already exist, they don't have the landscaping requirements that are that are in there, but they're just putting a deck on. Okay, well, we can require you up to 5% of the project cost to put into the landscaping. So with the ninth of this piece, and this was in the previous list of J as mm -hmm. well, is, is the goal of 
the provision to be you would cover the cost of coming into compliance or five percent, whichever is lower. The way yes. It, so, so I think the problem with the way it's worded now is the last sentence indicates that the developer can just it's not to exceed five percent. You could just say, well, I'll commit twenty bucks to putting a planter in that complies with the non-conformity. But I think if we were to say something that would take the step to make existing non-conforming sites, um, shall you know the need to come into compliance shall assume the cost, the lesser of the cost of compliance or five percent. This is they shall be required. It won't be their choice to put in the planter. It would be. It shall be required to add, but it's not to exceed five percent. So. Yeah, if I didn't word this right, when. I read, it, I read it to mean it's not up to the developer or the, you know, the, the property owner. It's up to the city to decide. Okay, that's good. So you're saying you're required to spend 5%? Yeah, so if, you, if you're trying to say it's either five percent up to 5% or it's the cost of compliance is less than 5%, you need the cost of compliance. But site is not. It's the not to exceed 5%. I, I get the sense that you're trying to say five percent the cost of compliance, whichever is lower. I think in this case, I, I would agree with you, except in this case, I think it works because it's following the first sentence. So the first sentence says applicants shall be required to come into compliance unless the cost of coming into compliance will exceed five percent of the total project cost. So at that point, we already know. It's twenty thousand dollars to come into compliance, and five percent is five thousand dollars. So in this instance, the applicant shall only be required to add landscaping in an amount not to exceed five percent. In amount of five percent. In amount. Same word. Yeah. It's in the sub. Add landscaping. Like I think it works as it is if it's not it's not perfect, but yeah, no, I just yeah, it, yeah. the way I read it is like it just it needs a little bit. Right. It could be more succinct if, if we wanted to go that way. My concern with it is really about the property owner being able to they can control the project cost and what they're asking for and so in that way we're kind of letting you could get to for instance you could I think you could probably go like if you have a large project you could cut it into two different projects so that you never come in at a project cost that's going to cause you to do much landscaping if you really wanted to yeah, play games yeah they, that's true and I think but what this does is, if we were to change the wording, just put them on notice that they've got five percent of their budget at risk for landscaping. Yeah, I don't think it would be driving anyone's decision. Oh, yeah. No, no. These, well, these are the things. These are the things that that catch us later on. I mean, the the, the reason why we're doing a fix. For the zoning is the fact that we spent seven years writing the zoning and we just, yeah. when it finally rubber hits the road, you end up with these things. We try to catch as many as we can. Yeah, and this is my first week. It's with wording. Well, but I, I get the sense that there is an intent to put a 5% cap or you can shoot for the cap or that means below the cost of all the Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm trying to think about how we would. Yeah, it's a, it's a kind of a I, I think we could we could put we could just say that they're required to spend you know an amount not to exceed five percent and leave out the come the compliance part. That's the that's the unnecessary part. I mean, if we if we want to make it more succinct. The other option would be to go and give the put put this take this as you said out of the applicant's hands and go and put it in that instance the DRB put it in rather than the applicant should only be required to add the DRB 
shall be required to add in front of some of the required. Yeah. Well, I think it gives the DR, at least puts in DRB's hands to go and say, okay, why don't you spend up to 5% on the total cost? And if somebody comes in and says, well, here's you know, $4,700 worth of landscaping that I can do, then the DRB has the option. Do we, do we want to push them to get the extra $300 of landscaping? or Since we're talking about nonconformities and the reason why, I think it might, it's actually kind of helpful to say it the way it is because of talking about coming into compliance unless the cost exceeds a certain amount because it kind of reminds us that you're a nonconformity and you have this special status and that's why we're not making you come into compliance. I think trying to do something that's more succinct may we may lose part of the purpose there. Okay. I mean, as I said, we, we came up with this and it's still, as we said, we, we like to have people read it. We like to have people chew on them because that's where we get to find to find this. But our key was for us was the fact that we did not have any rules for nonconformities in the current zoning. And that's a big issue for us because we have some projects that just exist. And for a minor change, we're stuck figuring out how to make them you know, add twenty thousand dollar landscaping to a ten thousand dollar project, and we don't have a way of saying you either have to do it all or nothing. So we have a couple other things in the agenda. Can can we spend like two or three minutes to get through the rest? Okay. And yeah, we and we're almost done. I mean, this right. uh, no, a six is the waivers, which matches the waivers above. Um, would not diminish the impact um, existing natural features, um, and then K is conditions of approval which existed under the old zoning, we just moved it into its own special spot that just goes and says uh, landscaping required under the section, whereas a condition of approval shall be maintained in a healthy condition and shall be replaced within one growing season with a comparable plant based on maturity, you know, blah, blah, blah. So um, that is, that's a uh, full rewrite of that section. Most of these, um, for your benefit, Aaron, we, we aren't rewriting the whole thing. We're doing a lot of little tweaks throughout this table. This was just one um, that happened to be um, a big one that we really needed to just completely rewrite. So I think we're, we're good. Uh, it seems like there's a consensus on a few smaller tweaks. Um, so you know it's kind of things. But you, right. So that would be something to pick up next time, would be um, a more detailed walkthrough of the uh, total site landscaping minimum planting area for the parcels of one acre and the parcels greater than an acre and how that looks. Mm -hmm. So let's plan for next time to talk about that, but leave the rest of it. Okay. As we've discussed so far. And, and, and I'm not going to plan to make too many other changes to this. So by all means, go home. If you want to reread this, pick it apart. You know, we're, we are, you know, got plenty of lawyers. Read it with the eyes of a lawyer too. These are all legal documents. Um, and, you know, keep it, um, think of it from an applicant standpoint. Think of it from an administrator standpoint. Um, uh, it has to work for both sides. You know, is it going to accomplish what we want it to do? Is it something that we can administer? Um, you know, if somebody gave you a site plan, would you be able to determine whether it's compliant or not? And, do you have a word version of this? Yep. Well. The issue I have is that the strikeout version of this has been remarkably growing internally, and it's like 30 megabytes, and it doesn't have all that many changes. Um, so I could send a PDF, or do you want something you can so actually you, note do into? Do you have a word red line? Is that what it is? It's in track changes. It's in track changes. That's, that's fine, because I'll just accept the changes. Okay. That, that's what's reflected in this document, right? Yeah, I'll try. I'll try to see if I can get it to to 
if, if it's not, I take can, the I track can changes. My, I can do it by hand. Yep. So, okay, so next time we'll revisit, uh, I think Stephanie mentioned, and we'll revisit uh, John's idea. Uh, tonight we're not going to be able to move to the punch list because we have only 12 minutes left. But this was, these were a bunch of the punch list. So this is this is the punch list drafted into so this was, actual changes. Yeah, and this is, was it all punch lists we've gone over previously or uh, some of some the stuff of we it. hadn't we had, to We had well? started to go Great. through the punch list at the last meeting and we kind of came up with a list that said develop new landscaping rules and present. So that's that one that right. went right up through. Um, well, if we indirectly knocked out a bunch of punch lists, I'll feel a lot better about it. <laughs> we uh, did. Um, okay. 3203, this one, this one, no guidance for non-conforming. Um, so yeah, Great. probably 10, we went through about 10 items in the list. Okay. Awesome. So those are a couple things for next time. So for tonight's agenda, uh, we're supposed to consider the minutes from September 24. Everyone has a copy. <clears throat> I'll uh, move to the minutes. Give me a second. Second. Okay. All in favor of approving the minutes? Uh, Legally, you could. Sure, go ahead. <laughs> if you don't, I might have to do it to a quorum. All right, so that means you had to vote Kirby, so okay. you vote to approve. Sure. All right. And with that out of the way, set schedule for the remainder of the year. Uh, so City Hall's closed November 12. Do we feel compelled to meet two times in November? Mike, would it put us far behind if we ended up missing one day in November and one day in December for Christmas? I, I, I mean, if we could get through and make a final determination on the 26th for the landscaping and the slopes get that city council I, I've, okay that would be I think that is achievable that would be good um, the, the issue the issue we have is we've got to go through all of these and this could take us another couple more months and the issue is we continue to struggle administratively downstairs and the DRB has been begging us to fix the, the slopes and the site plan standards. Do we not so, in, so if we only let's only do one meeting in November, but can we can you set this up and maybe it is set up in a way that like unless we we have to proactively go and flag something for discussion and otherwise there's a lot of these things you have recommendations. Oh for it, like, on the punch list? Yeah. Yeah we've we've tried. I mean it's I've and tried to end up discussing a lot of things that it's great that we have a lot of attorneys on the planning commission. <laughs> really thorough, but sometimes uh, there's not a whole lot of value add, and we have a lot of other things to do. Yeah, we've been wanting to get to the city plan. I think I think we should make room for the city plan for some meeting before the end of the year. Yeah, I would. Um, so if we get landscaping slopes done on the twenty sixth, then we still have other punches things to do. We do, and I think what John was was asking is that on on this list, uh, for your benefit, Aaron, the, there's yellow ones and there are green ones. The yellow ones are ones we, in my opinion, I think need to have a discussion. It could be a 30-second discussion. It could be a five-minute discussion. The green ones are the ones that I don't even think we need to talk about unless people have a question. So uh, we, we have been going through them line by line, but I think – but John has been thinking that maybe we can just go and skip all the green ones unless somebody highlights one and says, I think that's what I want to make 64 our, uh, a yellow one, in which case I'll make 64 a yellow one and we'll talk about it. That's been our approach so far. But you're saying go ahead. Go. Yeah, we actually end up going through each one line, but we keep how, saying we're not going to go through the How much has it grown ones. since last time? I only added one. 
You only added one. It's, it's another green one on the end. So that means that the, those green ones have been hanging out for a while, and we've said previously that people should let us know, and mm -hmm. no one has, right? I I haven't gotten any. Maybe we could bring it up to Leslie next time. We'll just at the beginning. Just yeah, say we're only going to review the well. yellow ones. Really That's why I'm thinking if anyone does have a, a green issue, it might be Barbara. So to give yep. her a chance to be here. Yep. In so, which case, we'll just you know I'll, we'll just go from 57 to 62. We don't even talk about the numbers in between because they're all green. Yep. And if people go through, if people have some time to go through, look at the yellow ones. I'm not always the clearest when I'm writing these things. You sometimes need to have them over here. I'm trying to write down the issues. You usually have to look at the, what the rules say, look at what this says, and go, if you don't, it's okay. I'll go through them real quick. But yes, I would like to get through this. I would rather get back to the master plan of city plan. Okay, so we'll plan to do that. I'll tell Leslie about the three things we talked about approaching the future. Maybe knock out the green ones since we since that those have been out there for people to look at for a while. Mm -hmm. um, but what does that mean for December? Do we want to try to? So we'll meet November twenty sixth. For definitely then, and make sure the landscaping and slopes are done. Okay. I'm fine meeting Veterans Day maybe, but how difficult would that be? I've got the. The issue is I got the day off and it's locked. Sometimes what we used to do in the past was to schedule things on Tuesday. So if we're if Monday the twelfth is Veterans Day, they'd sometimes meet the thirteenth instead. We're, I think we're likely to we're less likely to have conflicts on Veterans Day than Christmas. Right. I mean, so if yeah, we're going to yeah, try to make one of these two days, work. Yeah. <laughs> or, yeah, Christmas yeah. Eve. I, I well, mean, the Tuesday <laughs> would be Christmas Day itself. So. <laughs> Uh, that's also close for City yeah. Hall. So, yeah, I don't think the 26th is an issue. I don't think the 10th is an issue. Yeah. I might actually have a conflict with the Regional Planning Commission. But. Yeah, you probably would, but yeah, there's not much going on. You can see what the schedule looks I can skip like. this one. Go that one, maybe. You don't get for them. All right, I will email everyone about Tuesday the 13th because we'll also have to coordinate with Orca. And um, I'll have to make sure the room is available. Okay, so, so I will email. So, so following up on these three issues at least, um, and slopes for the 13th, so then we have 26th and the 10th to finish the punch list and make and get work ourselves on the back plan. on city plan, get city plan back on track. Wait a second. Okay. We're adjourned. Thank you.